Um, we have several items on the agenda, and uh, we'll try to get through those that are either consent or will be continued. We can move those on. The items we do have cards on are items 5 and 12 and 13 together, and those are the only three. So as we go through the agenda, on item 1, we can request that the City Attorney uh, to prepare the ordinance for that particular item. On number two, also to have the City Attorney prepare the ordinance, and have a request from the item number two. Number three, I believe, is consent and seeing no cards. Uh, number four has no cards, but we can approve with the amended T conditions submitted into the file. And you did get that on the file, Madam Clerk? Okay. Uh, number five will hold special given the cards that we have. Six is consent. Seven will continue in Palm to February 2nd, 2010, and in Council, I'm sorry, in Plum February 2nd, and in Council February 10 of 2010. That's number seven. Number eight will continue in Plum to February 9th. Number nine will continue in Plum to February 16th, and hopefully in Council March 3rd. Number 10 will continue to February 9th. 11 will continue in Plum to February 23rd. Hopefully in Council March 23rd. 12 and 13 are special. Uh, we don't have a report for item 14. Our director is asking the budget issues, I understand. So she won't be here for her report. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, yes, uh, with your permission, I'd like to request that we take items 12 and 13 out of order uh, in that I'd like to be here for their hearing and I may need to leave to chair my committee at 3 o'clock. So we're all backed up here. Huh? <laughs> okay, so let's do that, Council Member. Thank you. Um, so, Berkeley, you want to read 12 and 13 into the record? Uh, yes, council members. Item 12 and 13, uh, they're all related. Item 12 is a sequel appeal. Item 13, uh, specifically to a density bonus, it's for a proposed project in CD2 for 146 apartments, of which 109 are by right. Okay. Um, Staff, you want to give us just a quick summary? I know we had a discussion already, but just for the record. Well, what I would prefer to do is you had a uh, planning presentation. The key issues were traffic related with the traffic study. Sergio f walked in. He had some points of clarification that he could give you uh, in response, just to keep it brief. Sergio from oh, Department, Department of Transportation? Of Department of Transportation. Okay, and is this information that the city attorney was made aware of? I'm assuming these were the discussions with the city attorney. Why don't you come on up and some points identify yourself, Sergio, and uh, but Robert, if you can give us the thumbnail sketch of what is in front of us for the record. Okay, for the record, what is in front of you? Hopefully this helps. Um, the director's determination was issued on the project site on Magnolia um, for a density bonus project and a project permit compliance with the Valley Village specific plan. The director issued a determination approving the project along with the density bonus. Um, subsequent to that, it was appealed to the City Planning Commission. City Planning Commission then sustained the director's determination and the density bonus project with some minor modifications to the conditions relating to the height. Uh, subsequent to that, um, the environmental was appealed and also the project was 245 into I'm the sorry, city. Can you say that again? I can't hear your voice very clearly. Sorry. Subsequent to the commission, 
sustaining the director's determination with minor changes to the conditions of approval. Um, it was, the environmental was appealed to this committee. In addition, it was 245 into this committee. That's it in a nutshell. Right, but the environmental is, is an MMD. Correct? MMD for this project, yes. And with that MMD, there was a related traffic study. Now, the DOT representative is going to speak to... There were some issues that were raised at the last meeting, uh, last plum meeting, relating to the incorrect assumptions as to the baseline assumptions should this project receive previous credits from the existing development. Um, other items were that the traffic counts were underestimated for this project, and the last item about excessive uh, transit trips, just three points. Okay, okay, so this will address the concerns raised by the city attorney. Concerns being they needed clarification how we did what we did, okay. methodology. Okay, again, just for the sake of clarity, I'm asking you to repeat a lot of things. Okay. And for the record, too. If you just speak a little slower, guys, I know we feel a sense of emergency and rushing, but <laughs> you could just take a deep breath and calm down and speak a little bit slower, I think it would be to everyone's advantage. So, so would you like to please come on up? Thank you, Robert. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sergio Valdez with the LA Department of Transportation. And I'm here basically to address a couple of issues. Uh, the main issue that took place in this particular traffic study was the existing use credit. Should this project have been given credit for, uh, for the uses that are there right now? What we did is, and in this particular one was unique in most of the other cases, is that we combined three projects together, three projects that were in the area, and we combined them into one project. So we looked at it that the project description was for, a pro for the project on uh, Ben Avenue, another one on Magnolia, and this current project on Magnolia. So what we did when we did that is that we went back to the earliest environmental assessment uh, date uh, in application when it was filed, and we went back and, and checked to see if two years, if for six months out of the last two years, those projects had been occupied. And the answer to that question was yes. Now, we did it this way, which was maybe not the way we normally do it, in a sense, because we've never actually combined three projects in, in, into one project and had them studied, studied all together. So, but that's the reason why we did it. And uh, Mr. Brohard uh, brings this up uh, on there, and he, said, he says on there that we didn't follow our guidelines. In a sense, he is kind of correct we didn't follow our guidelines, but the reason that we didn't was because we were basically forging new ground as to how we were looking at, at traffic studies. We were looking at these things cumulatively. Um, even taking that into account, though, um, from the information that, that I have, um, it seems that the application date for this current project was March 25th of 2008. If you go back two years from that point, that would be March 25th, 2006. Um, so from March 25th, 2006 to the present, to March 25th, 2008, the project, in order for us to give it credit, should have been uh, um, occupied for at least six months out of that time. Now, it looks from the, some tenant lists that we received from the applicant that it probably was occupied during that time and taking a, a closer look at it. So it's probable that it looks like even following our own current guidelines, it probably would be okay. Um, as far as the, some of the, the other issues that stem from that as to the number of trip credits and, and the number of trips that we uh, estimated for this project all stem back from that in that the, uh, of the applicant's engineer, excuse me, the proponent's engineer, the, um, uh, not proponent, uh, the, the, the appellant's engineer um, says that the number of trips were undercounted. Well, it all stems from, the, that he, from whether or not the, the, the correct trip credit was given or not or whether he's in, in agreement with it not being given. Um, and as far as the transit use goes, because this project is located uh, adjacent to the orange line, it's been the policy of the Department of Transportation to give uh, um, um, trip credit for projects that are located next to the orange line, the green, uh, the, uh, and, uh, the green line, the, 
uh, the gold line for projects that are there and that they'll probably be more than likely using mass transit to get to work and do a lot of other things so they wouldn't be using cars as much and that's the reason why we've used 10 percent and we've used 10 percent in other locations for example in the projects out in North Hollywood area we've used 10 percent for projects out in, in uh, Warner Center uh, because because of that fact so um, that's basically what what I'd like to go through and clarify in, and in the, in the points that he brings up. Okay. Anything else, Robert? You want to add? Okay. I do have a couple of questions for you, Robert, and this is more again. When we look at the one of the points of discussion that was raised last time was the assertion that. If we allow this new development to occur, that in fact we would have fewer, and I say this in quotes, affordable units than before. Uh, given the nature of the units that exist today and how much is paid for rent, and then when you shift to the new development, you would have obviously new units that would demand market rates in that area and that the only affordable units would be those that were added because of the SB 1818 clause. In total numbers, are we in fact losing affordable units or are we gaining affordable Based units? Based on that, yes, it would be a net loss. A net loss, okay. And the height that's being asked for is to address that percentage that would be considered affordable? The height is necessary to achieve that 35% total, which is, what is the th extra 35%? No, no. Well, there's 35% over your base number, your base number being 109. That additional height is to accommodate the number of units between 109 and 146. So some of those are the affordable units. Some of them would be the market rate units. Okay. Okay. Councilman, any questions of the staff? Um, I have some questions, I guess, of the city attorney relating to the process that was used by uh, DOT, if that's appropriate. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. If you'd like to address the city attorney. Please introduce yourself, sir, for the record. Good afternoon. Tim McWilliams, Deputy City Attorney. Um, it, well, before I start with questions, um, I guess I'd like to ask the City Attorney uh, to comment on the methodology uh, for the traffic study with regard to the MND and any comments you may have about that. Okay. Well, be, because we have an MND, we are subject to a certain standard, which is the fair argument standard. So uh, when I looked at this uh, project, I tried to determine what a judge might do looking at this as well. So the methodology that DOT employed, while it was unique, uh, I did ask them to uh, come here today and, and respond, uh, and they have done that to a certain extent. Um, I think each of the three projects needed an individual analysis of uh, whether or not they met the two-year, six-month uh, requirement. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, Mr. Valdez has done that. Um, but because he was just given information today at the very last minute, I don't think he's had an opportunity to uh, analyze that to give a full, full opinion. So I think the MND is subject to uh, attack on that basis and also that a fair argument has been raised uh, not just with the trip credit but also with the uh, transit uh, credit issue again because we're looking at an MND here. So Councilman, I just want to ask him a question in terms of I want to make sure I heard you correctly the information from Mr. Valdez does that put you in a different place in terms of how you assess this project? No, I really ha I had pretty much everything uh, already that he that he said here today. Okay. Um, in in mind. Okay. So that's what we're going. Any other questions? Well, in in light of the information you've heard today and the the unprecedented way that DOT analyzed this and combining the three projects and in light of the 
the gray areas that uh, are described uh, in the memo then, what, what would be your recommendation with regard to uh, the, uh, the CEQA appeal that we have before us? I think a fair argument has been raised by the uh, appellants with respect to tr uh, traffic impacts. Okay. Now, now let me ask you this, and again, this is about process and how we got here. Um, during the commission discussion, and given how the commission postured itself, the issues raised by the city attorney's office, were they raised then? Uh, Chairman Reyes, I was not involved in this matter before last Friday, so I really don't know what transpired. Um, now, do we have the city attorney present at planning commission when they're having their discussions? Terry Kaufman, Messia City Attorney's Office. Uh, no, we, we don't. I could. But we've got the uh, determination. So they obviously put the project forward and came to a different conclusion on the environmental clearance. So uh, it's just speculation now that if you would have been there, you would have given them that legal guidance at that time, given concerns being raised today. That's all speculation, but that could have happened. Um, I, I thought that the that this traffic uh, that the letter from the traffic consultant came in after uh, the planning commission. That was my understanding. So it wasn't raised at that point. Mr. Duenas, isn't that is that correct? Mr. Duenas. Oh, sorry. The exact question being the the um, the traffic analysis that was put forward by the appellants came in after the city planning commission determination. Isn't that correct? Isn't that correct? Came in after. Um, I think the, if I can recall the meeting, I think it was discussed, but the traffic study came after. Okay. But that's a partial explanation of what happened. All right. I'm just trying to understand our own process and how we get here, because press can say sounds a lot of time if we address the things in commission, but that's besides the point. Um, okay, Mr. Dennis, thank you, staff. And uh, I'll be going through the cards now. And uh, as protocol has it, we'll be asking the appellants to come up first, and then uh, we'll ask the applicant. So the appellants on record, uh, We have a, a Ron Hirsch. Are you on record, sir, as the appellant? Or oh, the applicant, I'm sorry. Okay, then he'll come later. <laughs> okay, do you have. Uh, those that are, that are appellants want to come up to the microphone and uh, identify yourself? Mr. Reyes, Terry Kaufman, Messia City Attorney's Office. I just wanted to point out when you're speaking about process that we're here on uh, under charter section 245 and a CEQA appeal and that's why um, there may be information that um, this committee has that commission did not have so that's okay. another explanation that's another variable there okay uh, good day can you please identify yourself good day my name is Sandy Hubbard I am an appellant and okay. was uh, visible in front of you the last time. Thank you so much for allowing us to speak again. A couple of things that I did want to bring up again today without uh, rehashing everything we did. I wanted to introduce a letter to you, which I have done for your files, um, that confirms that the building next to this project is, three, is four stories in height, but fits within the 36-foot height limit, that they offer 97 units for occupancy in this coming quarter. So it is not an old project. It has been newly approved. Uh, that they voluntarily put financial incentives on their project to allow firefighters and police officers and teachers an incentive to move into this building. This was not something that the city required, but something that they voluntarily did to provide affordable housing still within our community, understanding that they had been tearing down affordable housing. Um, I wanted to also point out to you that they have been vacant since early in July of 2007. So when you talk about two years and six months, that clock has expired. Um, I wanted to also point out to you that the 12 affordable units that will be proffered in this apartment complex under consideration, they're primarily facing walls. They are not interspersed through the project. 
This is not the design that normally uh, affordable housing is supposed to follow where it's interspersed and kind of just mixed in and blended in. They're kind of being penalized in, in it's a punitive way of treating the affordable housing as proposed currently. Um, I also wanted to tell you that all the information that was submitted by the traffic analysis, uh, that even though it wasn't in front of Plum, all the information was there. It's just presented to you differently. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Next uh, appellant, come on up. Sorry for my height. Um, I just wanted to bring up two different points that were um, just stated by Sergio that are not correct. First of all, um, there were three units occupied as of July, you know, at that date. There were, it wasn't 39 in the building next door. And the completed date of the application where the application was deemed complete was 3-3-2009. There was an application filed in 2008, but they, the um, applicant had to file a new master land use a new master land use plan, and it was not deemed complete until 2009. So that also expires the clock. Um, and I, I just want to read you a, a, a brief as brief as I could be. Um, I'd like to remind the committee that first and foremost, SB 1818 is an affordable housing ordinance intended to raise the number of units. And as we've already discussed, there will be a net loss of 39 affordable units to the city stock. At this rate, if all SB 1818 projects follow this rate of return, SB 1818 will produce a net loss of affordable housing by approximately 78%. If the city truly wants to increase the affordable housing stock, this isn't a good plan. The community is not against affordable housing. We have lived next door to it for over 20 years. We are against over-densification that neither fits within the character and scale of the community nor the limits of the infrastructure and in fact decreases affordable housing. Um, and the community realizes that there will be something built here and actually that's preferable to us because the, I can show you pictures. The, the, the way this property has been left at this juncture, one of the two properties is in horrible disrepair, and we have asked for abatement over and over again. So it, it's not that we don't want something built. We're only, the right. city, the um, community is only asking that it be built within the limits that the, um, will find, will follow the confines of what the present infrastructure, are you, am I, am I done? Can you wind up? I, I, I'll go real quick on, on the traffic, because there, were, there are seven, several can you just traffic. wind up really fast? Okay, that, that are new, new issues. One is that the um, traffic study never, and this is their own words, not mine, they never address the operation of the interval site, the individual site access scenarios, the adequacy of interval parking supplies, or internal circulation. And when you're talking about Magnolia Boulevard, which is a substandard street, which will remain a substandard street, this is critical. They're, they have no plan for the rest of the of us to escape. I'm going to economize your time, so can you please? Okay. Um, there's also three intersections that will remain at an, uh, there are four intersections that will remain at an LOSF level, which is the worst level of service, right. even after all the mitigations. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to try and get out of your hair is what I'm going to Thank you very to. much. Thank you very much. But I have a lot more to say. I, can I submit I it in writing? That. Can Thank I submit that in writing? Oh, mind? absolutely. Jennifer Reed, an appellant. Um, I'm here on behalf of Joan Brosnan Skilbeck, who is the owner of the apartment complex directly to the north, and she gave me a letter um, authorizing me to speak for her. Um, as shown by the site plan of the project, the developer, Gary Shavel has designed this 11933 Magnolia Building project with the intent to eliminate the required rear yard setback of 15 feet that would, as a matter of course, be the code setback for the south end of, our, of the property at 11936 Weddington Street. Mr. Schaffel's oversized four-story building that busts the height limits of Valley Village specific plans spanning the, 11, the 11927 and 11933 Magnolia lots will tower over our building only seven feet away. The configuration of his two purchased lots of uh, 11927 and 11933 is irregular and he planned to tie them together in a lot tie in order to build this project but not by doing it the correct way with a public hearing prior to the project approval. The CPC did not address this matter and the city planning department steered them away from addressing it. 
Mr. Schaffel will be able to call the rear boundary of the 1193 parcel a side yard. And he, um, that abuts their, our boundary instead of a rear yard when the lots are tied together. The requirement for a side yard setback is only seven feet. This is what is pictured in his site plan and the developer who made the determination did not follow the rules or guidelines by setting a public hearing on the zoning variance, which they by default gave to the developer before setting a public, gave to the developer before the fact. Holding a public hearing after this SB 1818 project was approved would, be, would taint the zoning administrator's objectivity in weighing the effects and lead to a denial of our claim. We wish to halt any zoning variance on these properties in progress. Please continue. Oh, thank you very Just much. Just conclude, please. Okay. Um, we wish to halt any zoning variance on these properties in progress or contemplated or completed and ask that you do so now. We are directly impacted. It is a discretionary matter. There are no proposed mitigations that you can suggest that will make a 45 foot 7 inch building or more standing 7 feet next door to our lot line go away. We Thank you, Can you can you round up? Uh, sure, it's her letter, so I'm. Just give me the last sentence. Let's see. Um, well, they are, they, she goes on to say that that the state law is not to spot zone all uh, the neighborhood of the state willy nilly. No 12 affordable units that this project is offering the city of Los Angeles will outweigh the impacts this project will have on the surrounding neighborhood and Valley Village character, especially after he evicted the 51 units in the two buildings that were very affordable. Thank you, ma'am. And she also Thank you very much. mentions a subdivision act here that. You can submit it to, for the record. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, anyone else on record as an appellant? Seeing none, I'll go with the next card. Um, Barbara Bonahan Burke. And then Lisa Sarkin. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Bonahan Burke. This project removes 51 affordable housing units and replaces them with only 12. 12. It's totally contrary to the concept of SB 1818 as it was passed in the state. And planning, city planning commission, the Plum Committee, and the city council should be scrupulous in their examination of documents and assertions by developers on projects that evict the people that are already in there within affordable housing. Um, the developer is not just putting in for this apartment project, he previously evicted the 54 units prior when he was applying for a 78 unit condo track map. So I believe the zoning is at issue, RD 1.5, the land use, low residential, and you, they can't use, and what I heard last time from um, the city department and I believe um, of planning and I believe also the developer, uh, one of the developer sides was that, as I understood it, and I have studied SB 1818 as we all have, they were trying to use both the California law and the implementation law, uh, implementation of the city law. And you can't have it both ways. You've got to use one or the other and, and not choose both in what you want. So I believe the assessments in the file have to be for this project, not the former condo project, and all the assessments of the infrastructure and the effects it will have on the neighborhood and community should be for this project, not held over from the other. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Lisa Sarkin, Studio City Neighborhood Council. Uh, as you know, last week I read you the motion from the Studio City Neighborhood Council. We support the appeal of the Valley Village uh, stakeholders. The developer must substantiate, in our opinion, the economic feasibility of the concession. Only parking is actually a buy right, so a new site plan should have been required when the switch from condo to apartments was uh, allowed. And, and since we don't have a design of this building, how do we know they need the extra feet in height 
and the, the um, variance, which I call it a variance, for the smaller side yard or backyard. If we knew what that was, maybe they're using 12 feet for their height, which we have had in, in a, one of the SB 1818 buildings that was approved in Studio City on um, Moore Park near Coldwater. So I think that they need to uh, definitely show that they need these con this concession in order to build the, the affordable units. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we'll ask the applicant, Ron Hirsch, to come on up. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Hirsch. I'm a principal at Hirsch Green Transportation Consulting. We represent the applicant. Uh, we performed the original traffic study uh, for the project. Uh, we've also reviewed uh, the appeal. And there are a couple of things to point out in the appeal. First of all, uh, most of the, the appeal on the traffic is based on the presumption that the trip generation for the project uh, is understated. And we've submitted a letter to the file uh, identifying uh, our arguments against that. We believe that the presumptions are, uh, are, are not accurate. That the, uh, uh, based on the records that we've been provided by the applicant uh, as far as occupancy goes, the units uh, for all, of the, uh, all three of the project sites uh, were occupied for six months within the two-year period prior to the date of the traffic counts that were done, which is DOT's methodology. I want to be clear that it's not a timeline of two years and six months. It's six months of occupancy within the prior two years. Uh, and the, the records that we have show that that is indeed the case. In fact, the first uh, vacancies of any of the project sites did not occur until several weeks after uh, the traffic counts uh, were done. So based on the presumption that, as I said, the, the, uh, the appeal is based on the presumption that the traffic counts for, or the traffic estimates for the project uh, are, are uh, understated, uh, and in fact, the, the trip credits are indeed uh, appropriate for this uh, for this site based on DOT's policies and procedures. Uh, the, uh, another point was the uh, transit reductions. Uh, we, based on our consultation with DOT, uh, assumed a 10 percent transit reduction for use of the nearby uh, Orange Line, which, as you know, accesses the Lancashire uh, Transit Hub, which accesses uh, various other uh, transit facilities. Uh, the appellant points out that the, the CMP and uh, DOT, I'm sorry, can I make I'll, I'll wrap Please conclude. Yeah. Uh, the 10% the is based on DOT's uh, local knowledge of the area and not necessarily the general uh, regional, county, or, or uh, national guidelines uh, that are identified in the CMP or the ITE documents. Uh, one more point, and I'll be brief. Uh, the methodology used to combine all three of these projects and look at a cumulative analysis is indeed unique. Uh, but it provides for a much more conservative analysis of the impacts of, of the entire development, uh, including the three individual developments. And, and if I you. could, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Valdez to, to verify that statement. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Alan Bolivan? Or Bolivan? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Boyvin. I'm the architect for the uh, applicant. Uh, the one thing that you should be aware of with this argument about the uh, rear yard is that the, okay. the rear yard, when, it, when there are two or there's a jog in the rear yard, um, the far rear yard, the one that's furthest away from the street, is, in, is deemed to be the code rear yard, and the near one is a side yard. This is a code determination. I've actually run into it on several jobs. This is a city of LA planning department code determination. It's nothing we pushed for. We did our due diligence. We went to the planning department. We checked our set box. That was what was deemed correct. Okay, the second thing, and this is something that is somewhat irritating to hear these allegations. It's upsetting. It's upsetting. Uh, talking about the height of the building, number one, when we went through the appeal process, 
couple months ago. We volunteered, I volunteered, reducing the height of the building. It wasn't something that uh, was required. It was volunteered. We reduced the height bonus to 25% rather than 35% along the side and the rear. That was done voluntarily as, a, as, a, as an act of goodwill. And uh, number two, and, and of course the front yard, which, which we maintain the height of 35%, it really does not affect adjoining property owners. It only affects the street. Um, then, in the, in the more upsetting is, is the allegation that you could create a, a four-story apartment building in 36 feet. Uh, it's physically impossible. Uh, one, if you, may I go on? Can you conclude? Please Diffic finish. Difficult to do, but yeah, I'll do my I understand, best. but I need to okay. finish. If you accept that uh, eight-foot ceiling heights, uh, nine-foot floor-to-floor was acceptable in today's market, uh, you would still have the issue of providing roof slope, which might add another three feet to the 36, and the fact that the property has a differential uh, height of another four feet, that's seven feet plus 30, so you couldn't do it, even if you conceded that it, an eight foot ceilings, sir. right, it's impossible. Thank you. And I have other points to make, so I, 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 invite, that, but I need you to sit down, thank you. I, I invite any thank questions. You, thank you very much. Gary Schaefer. Gary Schaffel, Schaffel Development Company. We're the managing member of um, 11933 Magnolia Ventures LLC, the original developer of the project. Um, I was asked in response to the question about the um, original um, number of tenants in the units at what time and went through our records and uh, worked with the um, owners of the property to the west of us, which is called Project B. And um, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, two years prior to the respective EAFs being filed, the units were all were all occupied, and within six months of that period of time moving forward, the majority of them were still uh, occupied by tenants. Also, one to just a point about the um, state of the current units, the 51 units that are there now. When we purchased the property, they had suffered years of deferred maintenance. Um, they are now totally uninhabitable. We had gone in and done all the asbestos abatement work. The units are all vacant except for one person who's acting as a guard. And um, we've looked at this project as trying to reha rehab the existing units, and it is you know, economically impossible. The amount of money you'd have to put in to get those units even basically habitable is, um, is just not -eco economically possible. And lastly, to um, reiterate what um, Mr. Boyvin said regarding the rear setback, um, the appellant is saying this was a variance. I just want to reiterate that it is standard uh, planning department policy. No variance was required. Anybody going in with a site that had um, two different rear yards, we had two lots, one, each one 100 feet wide. The westerly lot was 300 feet deep. The easterly yacht was 325 feet deep, according to the planning department code. The westerly rear yard is treated as a side yard, um, seven feet, which is the same as our side yards in east and west. And the rear yard on the east side is 15 feet, which is as per the planning department um, requirements. Thank you. Did you want to say everything you needed to say, sir? No, I think that about covered okay. it. Thank Thanks, you. Okay. Okay. Um, Ben Hasnick. Okay. Just reading the cards. Good afternoon, council members. Kevin McDonald representing the applicant. Uh, first of all, in focusing on the Charter Section 245 case, remember, your inquiry here is limited to determining whether the single incentive that was granted here is needed to accommodate the project. And you've heard from the architect, he tells you it's physically impossible to build this building uh, without this height incentive. In terms of the MND, uh, 
to answer the question about the submission of the uh, opposition report, uh, it was submitted December 3rd. The City Planning Commission hearing was October 22nd. So the, this level of discussion about the traffic study did not take place at the City Planning Commission hearing. Uh, and, and the City Attorney's representative has told you that a fair argument has been raised, which may be true. But the rest of the standard, as I mentioned last week, is that that fair argument must be supported by substantial evidence in the record. The only thing you have is the letter from Mr. Bovard, which Mr. Hirsch has uh, quite thoroughly uh, gone through in his written materials uh, that are in the record, demonstrating that none of those points that were raised by Mr. Bovard are, are accurate. In fact, he twists and turns the policy statements of the Department of Transportation with several of them to use them for his convenience. Uh, and the issue of the methodology in this case uh, being slightly different, uh, I have been informed by the Department of Transportation, and hopefully you will call up Mr. Valdez to confirm this, that this methodology, although slightly different than what they have done in the past, results in a more conservative result. So if you were to undo everything and simplify the analysis, as has been the practice of the Department of Transportation, you would see that there would be uh, more trips. Or, or excuse me, it would be a less conservative result. And relying on the, uh, the methodology here is a fail-safe method. So I, w I wish you would please uh, ask Mr. Valdez to explain why that methodology is appropriate here. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, ben Resnick with Jeffrey Mangles Butler and Marmoreau for the record. A um, couple of uh, quick points I'd like to make. Much has been said by the community about the loss of affordable housing and the fact that it's a net loss. We're only gaining 12. What no one's mentioned is that the so-called affordable housing that they say is being lost are basically market rate units that were subject to rent control, but every time someone left, they go up to full market. Secondly, the 12 units being set aside are for very low income. Not low, not moderate, very low. There are zero very low income units on the properties. You pick up 12 very low income units. That has been the, the rub, if you will, of SB 1818 in many projects around the city. And so the call to equate so-called affordable rent stabilization units and equate them with very low or low is just a sort of a, a non sequitur. It's apples and oranges. Last point, with respect to the MND, I have to say that um, anyone can raise an argument. That's not the standard. The legal standard of a fair argument, as my partner, Mr. McDonald, said, is based on substantial evidence in the record. You have testimony from community complaining about height or other issues. The record is there are no impacts from the height. That's the, 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 there was a shade shadow study done. Everything was complete. The traffic issues have been addressed ad nauseum here. The reality is whether you do the study one way or the other, there are no significant impacts, and the appellants have not shown or brought substantial evidence to counter. What they raised are policy questions, and they don't even cite the full policy. And so don't be fooled by the standard of fair argument, because fair argument, while people think is some low threshold, it's not so low. You've got to have substantial evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Weiss, Mayor Tom Patterson. Council members, uh, first for the record, uh, we're also talking about a site plan review here. Uh, we're not just talking sequel, we're not just talking the uh, director's determination. Site plan review is appealable. That is also before the council. And the fact is the planning department did not do a site plan review. They exempted it. And all of a sudden we're going from, to, from 78 to 146, doubling without a site plan review. That's not appropriate uh, under any criteria whatsoever. Secondly, the economic uh, feasibility analysis, nothing, the record supports our side of that because we have submitted, the evidence that we have submitted clearly demonstrates that at a minimum, assuming even they need the 146, they can do it within a 40-foot building envelope. They don't need uh, the uh, 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 
the extent to which they're asking for. Um, and Mr. Resnick, I think, in his argument, is trying to make this into another Louise case. This is not a Louise case. At, in any way, shape, or form, this is not a design issue case. What we're talking about here is whether or not they need the incentive or concession in order to justify uh, the, uh, uh, basically what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, next, um, the, uh, I think another important consideration that really hasn't been brought out that for, for safety purposes, people turning left and in, left into this project uh, off of Magnolia. Um, this is a reason why uh, right now there are three driveways. You're, you're going to be adding uh, a lot of people and you're, you're, you're losing. Uh, I think an EIR, an evaluation of that situation is appropriate in the context of, uh, of this uh, situation. Um, also, fourth, the man or the, or the bank now has approval for 78 condo units. Now he's applying for apartments. My position is that's a de facto abandonment of his track map. We shouldn't basically allow people in this city to come in and speculate in the way that's being accomplished here. It, it, it just simply, uh, you know, not, not right, not appropriate. I think the fair argument has clearly been established. I think we need a, 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 an appropriate, complete um, EIR on this um, a, in order to evaluate these kinds of issues. The way the planning department undertook the analysis here, the record is clear. They didn't do it properly. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Tom Patterson. And then we'll have Michael McCure, I believe. And then we'll have final speaker, Dale Leibowitz Neglia. You already spoke? Okay. Uh, Tom Patterson, 5329 Vantage, apartment number four, Valley Village. Uh, with respect to the four-story building next door, we've been assured by the developer and his architect that the building was built within the 36-foot height limit of the specific plan. If, in fact, that's not correct, then the city should investigate the height of that building. And if the building was illegally built, then we should move forward to declare one floor of that building that's to be set aside for affordable housing, since obviously we can't tear a floor off the building now. With respect to this project, there's been 29 pages of con clear, concise, uncontroversial information that this site was not properly zoned in the AB 283 process. The evidence is, is so complete and comprehensive that it's undisputable. The problem is that the planning department directed the planning commission to not consider that issue, although it was part of the appeal process. That's the foundation issue of this project. It's, it's allowing too many more units to be built than ever should have been zoned for that frontage along Magnolia. And it's really critical that this, that this, ep, that this project be denied so that the city can go back and address that underlying zoning question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Michael McClure. And we'll end public comment. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Uh, my name is Michael McHugh. I'm with the Studio City Neighborhood Council. Uh, regarding infrastructure, the city has not completed a report on growth and in infrastructure since 1998 and has no idea what is really happening in the communities. They apparently don't wish to. The continuous reports that you receive are real on-the-ground reports from citizens. The city planning department has abandoned its job of planning the communities because they shove off responsibility to other city departments to make the decisions after the projects are approved on anything related to the infrastructure. They use boilerplate language and conditions to mollify the reader and are trained in how to frame the language in these DIRs and recommendations to make the developers seem beneficent in their partaking of the feast. Planning management trains the planners to push every project out the door as approved with conditions. SB 1818 and the city's implementation of it now quadruples that, and now the planning department in the city rejects any responsibility for the impacts of these projects that they have on the infrastructure and on the environment, and must not forget the lives of the people who lived in these little micro communities who were completely uprooted and are, many of them are no longer living even in the state and I know because many of the people uprooted in these projects were my close personal friends. As a wise planner points out, the current economic crisis opens up an extraordinary opportunity to set things right. 
It should not be a time to allow poorly conceived and evaluated projects to be rushed through a business-friendly approval process. Instead, review should be done slowly and carefully to allow sufficient time for the current and future federal stimulus packages to be directed at sorely needed public infrastructure. The planning department can take the time needed to plan this project, not just fill the zoning envelope. The need is now to carefully consider the capacity of local public services and infrastructure for development to meet the existing and future needs of the city's residents, institutions, and businesses. Thank you, Mr. McCoon. Okay. Uh, I'd like to have city attorney come on to the mic, please. In light of the information that's been forwarded in this hearing, and we've heard two different perspectives, I'd like to get your assessment on your recommendation. Okay. Um, I mean, nothing that I've heard today uh, changes my mind. It's not uh, anything new that has not been presented in, in the flurry of uh, correspondence and emails that, have, that has taken place the last few days. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's my view that the environmental analysis is, is uh, vulnerable to attack, um, and, and, and on that basis, I would uh, it's my view that a uh, fair, fair argument has been raised with respect to the uh, trip credit and the transit credit issues. So, Madam Attorney, if we were to follow the logic and the assertions made by the city attorney given today's discussion, what would be the recommendation to this committee? Terry Kaufman, Messina City Attorney's Office. Well, you have two items in front of you. One is, the, the first one is the CEQA appeal, and the second one is the uh, Charter 245 action. So the first thing you need to do is take your action on the CEQA appeal. And mm -hmm. it's the um, committee's discretion to hear the, uh, hear the evidence and make a determination based on substantial evidence whether or not you think this uh, environmental clearance is is adequate um, and you've heard testimony on that and if you um, conclude that it's not adequate then you would grant the CEQA appeal. That's the, the first thing that would happen. And that would be consistent with the citizen's advice who is analyzing uh, the MMD and, and his statements based on his analysis of the, of the trips. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, if we go down that road, then the next set of actions would be. Well, then, then you've got a um, under Charter 245. You stand in the shoes of uh, the commission's action, so you are looking at an appeal of the entire uh, determination of the director on the density bonus project and incentives. And in order to approve a project, it's got, um, this project has uh, density bonus project permit compliance. Uh, it does have site plan review. And I believe uh, that there are some additional findings on site plan review. I don't know that you'll get to that point. But it is discretionary. And so, in order, so CEQA applies, and you need to, uh, you cannot approve a project if you don't have a CEQA clearance attached to it. Okay. So, so I understand this is your district, sir. Would like to make a motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would. First, on item 12, uh, I'd like to move that we recommend that the council grant the CEQA appeal on the project. Okay. If, if you'd like me to proceed on item 13 as well. Okay, I'll, I'll say, given the analysis by the city attorney, and I, and I struggle with this because, and I'll just be very blunt with everybody, uh, from a big picture point of view, if you look at the landscape of the city, there's a very huge imbalance of what people are allowed to live in the city. And it's very obvious to me that when I am carrying densities of 70,000 people per square mile, and I see other districts that are at 6,000, 8,000 per square mile. The obvious question is where do people live? And the quality of life question comes along with that assertion. And so we have the high poverty levels, 40% of my district is at poverty. There's five districts in that condition. And yet we 
are in a place today where we are really dismissing, if not allowing for housing to occur in the city, to me there's a contradiction. But I also know that we have these legal issues in front of us, we have process issues in front of us. I wish this case would have evolved in a different way. Uh, but I also don't want to put the city in a vulnerable place, uh, given the strength of the case, as identified by the city attorney. So I would agree with the emotion, sir, in a grudgingly fashion because of these issues. Um, but that's something that I think you and I and my colleague when it comes back to me to wrestle with. When we look at our charge here as a whole city and not on a balkanized district by district approach. And Mr. Chairman, I, I welcome the opportunity to have that conversation and to try to identify ways that the city as a whole can move forward in uh, achieving our need uh, for additional housing while doing that within the restrictive parameters of the limitations of our infrastructure, um, our school system, and, and the many other factors that, uh, that are, are limiting factors on our ability to add additional growth. So um, I, I think it's, it's important to have that conversation so that we do start to determine how we can provide for those needs in a way that is uh, a logical foundation for a livable city for all 15 districts uh, for the future. So, again, I will support it for the reasons identified by the uh, city attorney and, and then their uh, analysis of, of where we're at with this case. Uh, and then I think this flows into another set of actions for 13. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on item 13, I would move uh, that we recommend to the council to overturn the action of the City Planning Commission in denying the appeal on the project permit compliance review the site plan review and the density bonus case on CEQA grounds only and that we direct staff to make appropriate findings based on the record and the city attorney's recommendation. Uh, Ma Terry Coffin, Messiah City Attorney's Office. Um, it's the decision of the director because once this body um, asserted jurisdiction under 245 then what you were doing is looking at the director's determination so you were acting on that on uh, as if it were in ap the appeal Quite well taken right. okay so I'll be the action of this committee is for items 12 and 13 uh, let's move to item number four Roberto before Mr. Corey has to leave <laughs> um, actually the next item councilman is item sorry five. is it four or five five council five okay and what's before you in item five is a uh, report from the commission. It's a draft ordinance relative to amendments to a specific plan for the LA Sports and, and Entertainment District. There's also some changes um, and an amendments to the development agreement. Good afternoon, Councilman Craig Weber, City Planning Staff. On November 12th, 2009, the City Planning Commission approved an amendment to the Los Angeles Sports and Entertainment District Specific Plan and its corresponding development agreement. The amendments to the specific plan allow uh, the following, an increase in floor area of just over 300,000 square feet. And let me just wait for, for a second. I just want to make sure that items, I mean, that items 12 and 13 will be in council this Friday. That's for items 12 and 13, so pardon the interruption. Please no go problem. Ahead. Thank you. Uh, so the amendments to the specific plan allow an increase of floor area of approximately 300,000 square feet and an increase in tower height for the Olympic North sub area from 200 feet to 350 feet. It introduces office broadcast and production uses to the Olympic North sub area and it expands the specific plan boundaries by four parcels. The commission's approval also included adoption of an addendum to the EIR that, was, that covers the specific plan area, showing that there are no new environmental impacts associated with the expansion and that the project fits within the parameters of the original EIR. And lastly, the commission's approval included an amendment to the third, and amend, the third amended and restated development agreement. This development agreement contains scalable community benefits package that includes provisions for local hiring, living wages, responsible contracting, affordable housing, streetscape, among other things. Uh, the project would result in an increase in job-related land uses and therefore an increase in the developer's adherence to the local hiring and living wages provision of the agreement. 
The inclusion of the four new parcels into the specific plan area allows for the comprehensive review of any development at that site subject to the various development standards and design provisions of the specific plan. Okay. And it also ensures that the overall site development is consistent with the otherwise successful LA Live campus just across the street. Okay. Additionally, the inclusion of these parcels ensures that any project developed at the site is consistent with the existing CEQA analysis that was conducted for the specific plan as a whole. While the specific plan as a whole offers unique sign regulations that are different from those that exist within section 14.4 of the municipal code, the amendment as approved by commission does not expand the LASED sign regulations to the four new parcels. Rather, these new parcels would remain subject to the LAMC sign regulations as shown on map 8 on page 62 of the amended specific plan draft. Um, I want to keep my remarks short, but would welcome any questions. And I do want to note that the um, list of documents that were transmitted from the Planning Commission office to the city clerk did not include the actual draft specific plan, though there are a number of other draft ordinances. Um, and four copies of that draft plan have been submitted to the city clerk today. Thank you. And just one point I want to amplify, and that is, given all the issues that have risen in the past about billboards and signage, uh, these parcels in of themselves would be standing alone and would have to follow the codes and restrictions as defined by the city that are not part of previous specific plan agreements. Would that be accurate? Indeed, and that's an important point to amplify. Thank you. Okay. That being said, I uh, do you know Councilmember Corn has another committee he needs to, I believe, chair. Okay. But we do have uh, an extraordinary alignment of support here. I don't see any one saying no, uh, but I'd like to ask the council officer they'd like to speak. Uh, Mr. Fisher, are you here? No, no you are oh, such a wise man. <laughs> <laughs> when you have the full alignment of support here, um, any questions from Council Member that being the case, uh, I'd like to move that we uh, file the recommendation of the staff and move this forward. Uh, and then we read the, Roberto, read the proper language for this action. I believe, I believe you need to instruct the city attorney to prepare the ordinance, Councilman. Okay. It can be any more simpler. <laughs> that will be the action of this committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else, Roberto? Uh, Councilor, anybody have a public comment? Say so, um, Thank you. I know it was anticlimactic, but thank you for coming to City Hall. <laughs>